My name is Bill Walmer. I'm the director of connections. And uh, usually I'm the guy who does like the announcements and tries to get you connected. And Pastor Jim preaches, but he uh, asked me to do it today. And he's like, oh, but don't worry. It's only the third most attended service of the year. I'm like, okay. He's like, yeah, you know, this is the service that moms get their way. They get all their kids together and all their friends and all their family to actually show up to church. Yeah, but... Uh, like, uh, it, it's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm actually really excited to be here. And before we get started, um, I wanted to share just a little bit uh, a brag about my mom. Um, I was fortunate, I, and I know that I was fortunate because not all, all people have this story about their moms. My mom was a, a single mom growing up um, when I was growing up, and she worked two jobs. She was a nurse. She also did real estate stuff. She cleaned house. She did whatever it took to make sure that we had a roof over our head or um, food on the table. And not only that, like on uh, every sport that I played, I can remember when I was little, my mom was always my coach and she was always the hard, hardest on me. I don't know what it was about, but I was like, I hear this thing like when now that I'm a coach, like, oh, it's daddy's ball and all the, the, you know, the kids that have dads, they get to play. It was never that way with me. My mom was always hardest on me, but, um, and even uh, when we didn't have sports, like during the weekends, she would be taking us to the beach or to the lake, or we'd always be going and camping and doing something. So I know that I was, I was uh, fortunate in that. Um, but here's the thing is like, even though I, I know I probably wasn't always as grateful as I should have been, and, and I probably never said thank you. I probably still don't say thank you enough. So mom, thank you. Um, she's watching online or she might've watched last service. I hope I said thank you last service. But um, uh, I know I didn't say thank you enough, but even though that was the case, after all the things that she'd done for us, she never held me and my brother. She never held that over our heads and said, look at all the sacrifices I made for you and, and all the challenges that she went through. She never ever once complained of, of one of the eight trips to the hospital that we took because I broke so many bones and, or, or, you know, I mean, it was like a fast lane. It's like, oh, Bill's here again. Okay, you can go to the hospital and take him. Fortunately, my mom was a nurse, like I said, so she always had that. But, you know, all those challenges um, and, and all those sacrifices, I realized that I was the lucky one. And not everyone had as good a mom as me. But, you know, I want you to hold on to that thought if you are one of those people and we'll wait till the end because we're going to talk about that just a little bit. But here's the thing. When we look in the Bible, there are moms that we can look at that are amazing uh, examples of how to, one, live like moms, but also to live as Christ. And so today, uh, I'm not going to sit here and bore you for 35 minutes on, on my experience as a mother. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through some of the Bible passages. Yeah, somebody got that. Yeah, because I'm not a mom. Because um, I'm not a mom. We're going to look at some Bible passages, and then I'm going to do something a little different today. We're going to have three testimonies of some moms and the way they got through the sacrifices, the challenges, and even nurturing faith. So before we jump into that, I'm going to pray, and then we'll get going. God, we thank you. We thank you for our moms. We thank you for the great example they are. And really the example that they set for us is really the example that you want for us, that you showed us. And so as we grow uh, today, I hope that we take those examples, so some basic, simple examples that our moms share with us every day and realize that those are things that you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so today we're going to look at three of those things, three of those things that I think that moms do that are very much the way Jesus would live life. And so first, from our moms, we can learn that God is faithful through our sacrifice. Now, I'm sure most of you in the room, you know, if you're a Christian, you're like, okay, I knew the sacrifice thing was coming. But it's true, and I don't think there's a better example in Scripture of the example of a good mom that would do nothing but selflessly sacrifice their child or for their children than in 1 Kings chapter 3. Now, some of you may know the story. It starts in verse 16, but I'm going to paraphrase it so we don't have to go through the whole thing today, but it's about two moms. And we're going to say that there's one mom and they both have new, newborns. And the one mom we're going to call the devastated mom because she wakes up in the middle of the night and her child is dead. Now, as a police officer, I've gone through this. I've seen this sort of thing happen several times and, and I've investigated them and it's kind of, it's scary how it happens. Sudden infant death syndrome, sudden unexplained death syndrome, whichever you use. It, it, we don't know why it happens, but people in the middle of the night wake up and their child is deceased. It, it's a heartbreaking thing and it causes a mother in some cases to do some extreme things. And so what happens next, you might like not get, but in my experience, it's not too out of the ordinary. So what she does is she takes her dead child and replaces her dead child with a live child. So she now has 
a live child. So we're gonna call her the devastated mom. And the other mom, when she wakes up, she wakes up and finds that her child is dead. And immediately she goes, there's something wrong here. Every mother in this room knows that from the minute their child was born, they could pick them out of a hundred. Am I right? That's not my child. That's not my child. You stole my child in the middle of the night and a dispute breaks out. Now here's the cool thing about this story. Like they have the wisest king in the world and this is the person that they're going to bring their dispute to. The wisest king, the wisest person in the world gets to sit and judge this, this dispute. Now also as a police officer, I've experienced a lot of different judges and, and some are good and some are really good. We'll just go that way. Um, and sometimes you get the judges that, that um, don't seem like they're really concerned about what's going on. Some are just, just have some weird things that they do and, and things that I have one judge go on a 20 minute tirade. We had a, a jury selection and an 18 year old kid was like, I don't know why I'm here. This is stupid. I shouldn't be here. You should just let me go. I'm missing all the things. And 20 minute tirade, a lecture on civic, or a civic lesson and why we're supposed to be a part of the jury. I was like, oh my goodness. So each judge has their own thing. Now, so you're thinking, King Solomon, wisest, this is cool. This is gonna be awesome. This is gonna be in and out. And if you were in like the court, you'd be like, yeah, you should have saw the way he did it last time. Man, it was amazing how he sifted through the ins and outs. And, and, and that case was great. He, he just handled it well. So when they come in, they're like, okay, if you're in the court, you're thinking this is gonna be easy. Wise king, simple and easy. Well, it is simple, but it's kind of scary the way he handles it. He goes, get me my sword. Now, if you're in the, the courtroom, you're like, what did he just say? What's he gonna do with that sword? Well, what he says is, all right, I'm gonna cut the baby in two. Both moms get half. Now, does that seem wise? I'm like, if I'm there, I'm going, there had to have been a better way. But really, it was amazingly effective because sure, the devastated mom, she's like, yep, if I can't have the baby, no one can, right? But the mom of the child throws herself at the feet of the king and says, wait, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. I'd rather have my child alive with someone else than dead with me. And that's the kind of sacrifices moms make day in and day out for their children. You see, you would think that this sort of thing was common sense, but it took the wisest man on earth to go, you know what? True, the true parental relationship was proved by love. That's the way moms do it. Moms do it day in and out based on love because they want to see the best for us. We actually see that with Jesus as well. We see that as God as well. But here's the thing, that sort of self-sacrifice, it can't be easy. It, it seems so unnatural. You wonder if it, is it even rewarding? What's going on? And we don't see in the story if it is. So I've asked Lexi Terrell to come up and share about some of the sacrifices that she's made as a mother and, and, and the blessings that God has given her through it. Good morning. I am Lexi. Um, I am a mother of two boys, ages nine and five. Life is fun. Um, <laughs> you know, motherhood really is a wonderful, beautiful blessing, but it's not easy. It's really hard. And there's a lot of sacrifices, like Bill said. Um, from the very beginning, we're sacrificing things like our time, our sleep, our social life, our bodies, our brains. Um, I don't know about all you moms out there, but I used to be smart. Um, I, used to, <laughs> I used to be able to have conversations with people, and now it's like I can't even put two words together, and I'm looking like a zombie as people are talking to me. Um, but you know, ever since then, we are faced with constant battles. And I feel like we are continue, continually sacrificing through all the decisions we have to make as a mom. And I'm talking about like those really heavy weighted decisions, the ones that can impact your family dynamic, your children, their futures, who they're gonna be. Things like, am I gonna be a stay-at-home mom or a working mom? Am I gonna homeschool or public school? And then parenting strategies, like do we pay our kids for chores and teach them a lesson in finances, or do we not pay them and have a, be a lesson in helping others and family contribution? Or you know, how close can I be to my children without being a helicopter parent, but close enough that they still know that I'm there and I love them and I wanna protect them? You know, and 
we can be so hard on ourselves for making the wrong choice. We don't want to mess up our children. Um, but, you know, I found that no matter what path we choose, God is right there with us. He meets us where we are, and he blesses us through whatever choice we make. And there's two things that God has really blessed me with, that he's taught me. And the first one is perspective. I need to be willing to see things from a different perspective. You see, my life didn't go the way that I planned. And that's okay, because God had better plans. I don't need to be on par with all the other moms because it's not a competition. It's okay if my children are a little slower, a little different and really weird <laughs> compared to the other kids because they're gonna bloom in God's good time. And it's okay, as hard as it is, especially in my stage, it's okay to just stop and be still and embrace the chaos and the mess and the noise because I know one day it's all gonna be gone. And it's gonna be clean, it's gonna be quiet, and it's gonna be empty. And I'm gonna miss it. And it's okay if we don't have all the right answers, or if we do things perfectly. Because the second thing I've learned is that it's not just God who shows us grace, but our children do too. I mess up a lot as a mom, I feel like I get more things wrong than I get right. But at the end of the night, my kids still want my snuggles. They still love me, and they put their trust in me. They care about me. They don't show resentment. They don't shame me for all my wrongdoings. And if my kids can be that gracious with me, why can't I be that gracious with them? To myself, with other moms, other people. We need to be willing to see things from other points of view and just be gracious and kind to one another because we're all facing battles. You know, God says that children are a gift, and they are, but they're not just a one-time gift. God continues to bless me and teach me things every day by being a mom. And I'm so grateful for every day that he has allowed me to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. And just like our moms, just like our moms and their, their sacrifices, we are called to live and be marked by sacrifice and marked by that love that, that we have. Jesus tells us that we will be known by our sacrificial love. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 2, verses 3 through 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significantly than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interests of others. And that thought is completely encapsulated by our moms. This is a world that we live in that, that fights against that, right? That tells us that we need to impress our wills upon everybody else and, and share with everybody else our truths. And, and it's about us, what we want when we want it. But the Apostle Paul's reminding us that's not what Jesus said. That's not what he did. As a matter of fact, we see that no clearer than in the Garden of Gethsemane when he sat there on his knees and he prayed to God with blood pouring out of his pores saying, God, please let this pass, but not my will, your will. He gave up in humility. He gave up his will and wanted to sacrifice so that way we could have a relationship with Jesus. You see, Paul reminds us of that lowliness of mind, that idea of being humble through this and keeping that idea of humility in there, in our minds is that exact example of what Jesus did. Our moms take that love to that next level, and we are being challenged to do the same. And here's the thing. As Lexi said, when we do it, the blessings will come. Next, we see that from our moms, we can learn that God will use us uh, as we endure life's challenges. 
Now, I'm sure in a room like this, there's nobody that has any challenges. I mean, we've, we're mostly church going people, right? This is like, this is the, once you go to church, once you get saved, once you're with Jesus, it all, it's just easy from here on out, right? <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's the thing is like, we, the only thing that's, that's certain in life is that we're gonna face trials and, and challenges and temptations, and they're gonna always be around us. But here's the thing, there are gonna be times when we're like, feeling so solitary, so alone, that we we can't imagine that there's anybody else that has been going through this as well. You see, there are so many moms in the the Bible that we can look at that that will help us recognize that faulty thinking. But there's one that I want to point out specifically, and it's Naomi. Naomi is uh, a a lady in the book of Ruth. And, And now, the book of Ruth is more about uh, the, the, the story of Ruth and her kinsman redeemer. And it's supposed to parallel the idea of Israel and its need for a savior. But we see something about Naomi in here that just stands out when it comes to challenges and trials in her life. And we see the beginning in the first five um, verses of this book, why it's so challenging for Naomi. Uh, Naomi, she was born in Bethlehem and she is married and she is about the time that there's a famine and and she has two children and she decides to move to Moab because they feel like that's going to be the best place for them to live. And while there, uh, she has two children and they end up marrying. So she has everything that she would want to fill her heart. She has a husband, two sons, now has daughters-in-law, and I can only imagine that those, the, the, the thing that's really filling her heart is the thought of grandchildren, and I know that there are so many uh, moms and grandparents out here that you understand that desire, that, that she must have just been glowing. But within that first five verses, we find that whatever happens, something happens where they, she loses her husband and both her sons. Now, Think about that for a second. Some of you guys here understand what it means to, to feel lost, right? You, you have felt loss in the past where, where you've lost a husband, you've lost a son, maybe you've lost a brother, a mother, a father. Uh, but in this case, I'm like, I'm blown away because she's lost her whole family in one fell swoop. I've dealt with that as a police officer only a few times where I've had to, to break the news to, to people that you're the only one left. And it's, it's just crazy how devastating it is. I mean, what do you do but fall lifeless on the floor? But what we see in this story is even though this is a male-dominated culture and, and it's something that where she probably wouldn't have been able to succeed on her own, especially caring for her two daughters-in-law, she develops a plan. That's the thing is she didn't give up. Even so she faced the trials and the challenges, she didn't give up. She developed a plan. The first plan was, all right, ladies, you need to go back to your families because I'm too old to take care of you. I don't know if I can handle this in in this culture. So I want you to go to your families. And one of them takes her up on it. Says, okay, I'll go, I'll go home. And the other one, Ruth, stays with her. And so now she has, has Ruth, and, and, and she's like, well, I'm not going to be able to do it here in Moab by myself. I'm not going to be able to take care of both of us. I don't know if I can handle this on our own here. But she decides to go back to Bethlehem and thinks that I've got family there. I've got friends there. And maybe this is a place where I can start over, start fresh, and maybe we will be able to continue on with life. And what we see is as she goes home, she is actually welcomed. She's welcomed by the families and the friends that remember her. But here's the thing is it's, it's kind of like that two-edged sword where, yeah, she's being welcomed. But remember when she left, she left with what was assumed to be everything in that culture, like a family. You had everything if you had a family. And now she's returning with nothing. She lost everything. And we can kind of see how, how her mindset was when she came back to Bethlehem uh, in chapter one of Ruth, verses 20 to 21. She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. Mara actually means bitter. Call me bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? And the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. But here's the thing, and that's, that's her mindset. 
but she continued to endure through that challenge, and she was able to help Ruth work things out. And if you don't know what happens at the end, Ruth ends up finding uh, somebody to marry, and everything is it's hunky-dory, right? That's the kinsman redeemer. That's that relationship that, that, that Israel needed. They needed that savior. But here's the thing that I wanted you to see. Um, we don't see what happened or what ha- her mind processes or her thought processes or how God worked through Naomi in this. But it had to have been challenging. It had to have been lonely. It had to have been crazy through it all. But I asked Christine to come up, Christine Threat to come up, to kind of share because She's got a few kids. She's, got a, she's faced a few challenges, but I wanted you guys to hear from her mouth how God has walked her through some of these challenging situations. Good morning. I'm Christine. Um, I think Bill had me come up and just talk about challenges I've experienced because I'm a mother of five. Um, Now, none of my challenges included loss, like Naomi experienced. My challenges have been just more typical, I think, of most moms. Um, Most of us could probably say there are different challenges in different seasons of parenting. But I've experienced that through all of them, God is by our side and he's faithful. In the early years as a mom, I focused on meeting the needs of my children, both physical and emotional right, the diaper changes, the feedings, dealing with the occasional meltdowns. Um, That's what a lot of us deal with at that early stage. Um, I remember having a five-year-old, a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and a newborn. This season was so precious, but so overwhelming. (laughs) I remember feeling exhausted and very inadequate as a mother a lot of times. I remember literally hiding from my five-year-old and three-year-old in our upstairs walk-in closet while my younger two were napping, just trying to get a few minutes of quiet alone time before I knew I'd get recruited to play princess (laughs) dress-up. Now I have four teenage girls, ages 14 to 19, and an eight-year-old boy. And the challenges I face right now are quite different. You know, this season is fun, but it's really busy. <laughs> you know, oftentimes in the evenings, we will be double, triple, maybe even quadruple booked. And I'm just trying to figure out how everyone's gonna get where they need to go, how I'm gonna be there to support those that I, I really wanna be at everything and support. Um, sometimes it's impossible though, can't be multiple places at once. Um, but th- in these moments too, it can be overwhelming and I think it's, a normal human response to feel overwhelmed. It's also sometimes the challenging, it's challenging to find opportunities to speak um, God's truth into our kids' lives as they're teenagers. And it's so important, right? Because they're facing adult decisions. And I so want them to know God's perspective on their on their challenges and on their decisions. And it's challenging to find time to spend with my kids now that they all have schedules of their own that are crazy with you know, school, work, friends, um, the sports, all of that. Um, I don't have a captive audience anymore. So just finding the quality time with them um, can be challenging, but so important. So. There are two verses through all these seasons that God has impressed on my heart, and I just wanted to share and hope that it'll encourage you as well. The first being Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will, not, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And this is a reminder to me that I don't need to be overwhelmed by all the daily life brings, but all I need to do is call upon God to renew my strength and give me his perspective, because he's so faithful. He's a God of provision. And we can remember that in these times of chaos. God's strength is our source of strength. We just need to call upon him. And the second verse is Isaiah 40, 11. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs, 
that's our children, in his arms and carries them close to his heart, he gently leads those who have young. This is so encouraging because we don't do the parenting thing alone, right? God is with us. So I hope these verses were encouraging to you as well that no matter the challenges we face in our day to day, God is in control, he watches over us, he carries our children close to his heart, and we can get his strength and guidance. They're available to us whenever we seek him. Thank you. Thank you. So Christine said, their, their, their challenges are so varied. It's not always the same, right? It, or or it, it's not just the loss of, there's just so much going on in all of our lives. Now, the thing that we can learn from Naomi is that, that God will still use us to impact the lives of, of our family and our community, even through our challenges. But I think the cool thing that we learned from Christine is that in the midst of those challenge, challenges, God is walking with us through them. And when I think about challenges and temptations, I think of the words of James in in chapter one, uh, verses two through four. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let that steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We can fast forward to verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You see, it seems like those challenges in life that that some of us want to run away from God because of are actually there to have us run back towards God. Those challenges are meant to have us go to God where he will strengthen us and he will get us through them just like Christine poured out, pointed out. And, and the last thing I want to remind us about challenges is that maybe God has had us go through some of these challenges so that way we could be a blessing to someone else who is going through it now. We see moms all over doing challenges and doing them so well, especially those that, that rest in the Lord. Thank you, Christine, for your words. And finally, from our moms, we can learn that God will bless us when we nurture faith. Now, when it comes to nurturing faith, there there is one person in the Bible that really stands out to me, and and it's the disciple Timothy. And I think for me, it's because, you know, I I remember as a a young Christian hearing the the words to him, you know, don't let anybody look down upon you because because of your age, but set an example, right? And so like, he always was uh, the the guy in my mind, the disciple that I wanted to be when I was younger. But it's kind of neat because he ends up becoming a a, a trusted friend to to Paul. He's he's an emissary. He's a missionary and he's a leader of the early church. And we don't know a whole lot about him, but we have a couple of verses that we can glean a lot from, if that makes sense. And it starts in Acts chapter 16. What we first learn is that he came from uh, a Jewish, he was the, the son of a Jewish woman um, and, and was the son of a, a Greek. Now, that doesn't sound impressive, but we'll get to that in a second. And, and here's the thing in 2 Timothy, the words that I think every parent wants to hear about their children, right, is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you. Now, I know you guys are probably thinking I'm reading way too much into this, but, but, but hear me out. In these two simple verses, we see a world of information. You see, right away, the father was Greek thing. That means that he wasn't Christian. And fathers were like the head of the household back then. And so if he wasn't making the way as, as, as a Christ follower, who was? Well, we know immediately it was his mom. You see, his mother had more to do with his upbringing and his education than his mom. And that's very true today, right? I would say that there's a lot of men that work out of the house and mom works a job and cares for the kids, probably a lot more than us men. But, um, but their mom had a lot to do with their upbringing and education. And we hear a lot about this person. His mother was a Jewish woman, so she already had some concept of God and and, and faith, and she believed. And what she meant, that meant she believed was she was a Christian. Okay, and not only that, Paul says faith dwelt in her. Not just like she went to church, like she showed up and she did things. It dwelt in her, and whatever she did, it poured out of. She had a genuine faith. 
And it is amazing how that was passed down to her son, Timothy, who became a pillar of the early church. I mean, as a parent, if I heard those words about either one of my kids, and my kids are okay, they're okay, but you know, maybe not great. But if I heard that about my kids, I'd be glowing until I died. But here's the thing. I'm still in the midst of it, and it's hard. Nurturing faith is hard. You guys know this. You guys get this. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask a woman who has basically graduated her kids out, and she is somebody who's been around for a long time, and she is an amazing mom, and, and she doesn't give you the whole picture. I'll, I'll just tell her that. She, she shared some things with me um, before, and then she like cut it down a little bit, but it's just, she's an amazing woman. Brandy Tolman is going to come share about her testimony in nurturing faith on her children and how she got through that with God's blessings. Good morning. I'm Brandy. Um, so uh, what I wanted to share was um, when I was little, I was at a very small church. And Thursday night, I could do it a lot easier because smaller crowd. But not even like this part of the church was where I grew up. And my brother and I were the youth group. And not so fun, but we did have a lot of... Um, older people that loved on us and cared for us, but what I really wanted um, was something different. But um, anyway, later on, I think I was a junior in high school, my parents took us to a much larger church, and I'm like, yay, youth group. I get to meet other kids of my age that know God. And I went, and I was a little shocked. I was seeing kids that I went to school with, and those kids, I, I knew what they were doing, and I also knew how they treated me at times, because it's a small town, so I grew up with these kids, so it is what it was, but um, shortly after high school, I got married, and um, I reverted back to going to a small church, because it what I felt comfortable with, and um, my husband and I had our first two kids, and I was thinking, I don't really want the same thing for my kids that I had. So I started searching for a church, and we found Calvary. Calvary has great worship, that's what I wanted, and then we had a wonderful experience with our children's ministry. Now fast forward again. So now they're in high school. I had 10 years of high school. Yay. Um, so in those 10 years, though, we definitely had um, different youth pastors. So we got to experience different things with each of our children. Each of our children had different struggles. Um, and the encouragement that my husband and I had with them to come to church. It's like, I want you to hear God's word, not just from mom and dad, but I want you to hear God's word. And we're very lucky, too, that we were able to encourage our kids to come to big church here. So they got to hear our head pastor and learn from him, and that was, that was good. Um, but I'm grateful for being able to pour faith into my children. It wasn't just me. It was my awesome husband, my parents. So not only it was my mother, who's the grandmother to my children, and now I am a grandmother to one more coming, but I have two. Um, and I've got to see all, all four of my kids go away to college. All four of my kids seek a church to learn and grow closer to God. I got to see all of them find a significant other who knows God. And I'm so blessed that all of them have found the families as well that get to keep on pouring Christ into my children. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the, the thing is, is with Brandy, it's like, she's been around. She, she's, she was in the nursery with my kids when they were little. And, and it, the thing that she doesn't mention is, is she, how steadfast she was in, in sharing her faith and being a model example of, of a mom who, who worked at the church, who raised her children so well. And, and like I said, I, I know her son, her youngest son, who... Um, is really near and dear to my heart. I got to work with him in high school, and he's just a great man, and he will tell you it's because of his family, his mom, and all that she has done to um, bring him up. And that's the point of this, is the point of this is God wants to use parents to pass on an eternal legacy. Eternal. We sang about that in the song, Blessing, right? 
from generation to generation. And it's not just because of who we are, but it's because of what we do with our kids. It's how we teach our kids. It's one of those things where I'm going to finish with this last verse, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he won't fall from it. And that's one of the things. It doesn't say that just let your kids go, right? It doesn't. It, it's an intentional act. Training somebody is not easy. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes all the things. It, you can't just hope that it's going to happen. Jesus tells us to go and disciple the world. He doesn't say, oh, but not your kids. Somebody else will do that. You start at home. Our mission field starts at home. You know, there's this thing that my wife and, and I talk about when we do marriage mentoring. It's the priority list. It's God's always first. You always got to have your relationship with God. Second is your spouse. Third is your kids. Fourth is everything else. And here's the thing. It's like even like I, I get to do ministry and, and, and even ministry is everything else. If I'm doing ministry to the whole world, but I've forsaken my child... That's on me, right? Our kids are right up there in the top three. It's our job to deal with it, to, to train them. We can't minister to the world and neglect our children. So here it is, that conclusion. The, there's just so much that I want to say, the way I want to wrap it up, but I'm going to just kind of break it down into three easy challenges. And, and, but first off, I want to say thank you to the moms I got to share the stage with today. You guys were phenomenal. Um, I love you guys. The thing is, is like, I have a connection with each one in a different way, um, and they have all been a blessing to me and my family. Um, and so I, 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 you guys, they're great. You guys want to know them. And that's kind of the point of this whole thing today. Because in a room this size, I'm sure there's people that are looking at me like, dude, that was not my mom. Bill, you're crazy. I, I don't know what you're thinking. That, that my mom, all she did was yell and scream or, or maybe, maybe she drank and maybe she wasn't there for you. Maybe she, she ran away. Maybe, maybe she passed away. Maybe you didn't have a mom. But here's the thing. The thing that I love about working here and living life at this church is that there are moms that would love to adopt you. There are so many moms in this church that will take you in and want to grow with you, grow alongside you. I have women asking me all the time, hey, do you have anybody I can mentor? So if you are missing that in your life, email me. I would love to get you guys connected. That's my job. But that's also my passion. Get you guys connected with somebody who can mentor you. The other part of this is that I know that there are some women in the room that maybe could never have had children for one reason or other. Maybe you weren't married or maybe, maybe it's just medical. Maybe, the, I don't know what it is, but you didn't have children and you're like sitting here just heartbroken. Here's the thing is we have a ton of children at this church. We are a giant family. And I think you heard it from a couple of our, our, our guests that said it takes a village to raise a child. We want to be your village. We have people that, that would love for you to just pour into. If you want to be a mentor, if you want to work with students, if you want to work with children, let me know. I'll find a way to get you connected because they could use somebody like you. Now, finally, this challenge isn't just for the ladies in the room. This challenge is for us guys. I mean, sacrificing and, and leading through challenge and, and, and nurturing faith, it's something we're all called to do. It's not just moms. I mean, you've heard it firsthand, right? It's, it's hard, it's scary, but you heard firsthand from each one of these ladies that said that God will bless us through those big scary words. And here's the thing, when you break it down, sacrificing, leading through challenges and nurturing faith is really just trying to live like Jesus.